the early part of my career was really based on understanding the conventional science. I was teaching medical students, so I was really teaching from a curriculum. And while I was teaching conventional science, which was based on what is called genetic determinism, the belief that genes control our lives, I was engaged with cloning stem cells. And, and for me, it's very interesting because I was cloning them back in 1967. And at that time, there were just a handful of us in the entire world that even knew what a stem cell was. So I was in the right place at the right time uh, with the right research to reveal that uh, what I was teaching in medical school was incorrect that I started to uh, understand from the cell culture studies that it was the environment that was controlling the genetics rather than the genetics controlling itself. Uh, and, and this, of course, led to a schism. How can I be teaching in a classroom that genes control life and then go in the laboratory and realize that it was the environment in which the cells were living that controlled the genetics? I ended up actually leaving the system. I walked out. I had tenure and walked out. Uh, but I also then had an opportunity to go into quantum physics. And you go, why? Uh, and the answer is very profoundly important. Uh, as a biologist, almost all of my colleagues, uh, the conventional physics was called Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics separates the universe into an invisible energy realm and a physical mechanical realm. Newtonian physics says that the mechanical realm is not affected by the energy realm. So you want to understand a physical body then you have to really understand the physical mechanics of the body and ignore the so-called invisible realm. When quantum physics came in, it completely turned the tables on that. And it said that it didn't get, it didn't get rid of Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is a smaller science inside a larger science called quantum physics. And basically, quantum physics revealed that everything is connected by energy. And, and you say, so why is this relevant to biology? And the answer is, Physics means mechanisms. So I can say uh, um, quantum mechanics, quantum physics. And I say, oh, physics, mechanics. I go, mechanics means how things work in the universe. So even if you want to be a biologist, you really have to understand the mechanics of physics. So when quantum physics came in, it completely uh, conflicted with Newtonian-based medicine. And all my colleagues were Newtonian based and all of a sudden I jump off into the deep end of energy medicine, which is the new physics. And um, understanding that led me to a position at Stanford University School of Medicine, where I expanded on my research with cloning stem cells and also about the field, the energy field and the influence. So ultimately it led to my finding a whole new career for myself uh, and that uh, science, which is kind of fun because when I first started talking about this years ago, my colleagues said, well, you're a crazy person, you know, this is crazy, your ideas are crazy. Uh, and just like a couple of years ago, a, a scientist in one of my lectures came up at the end and said, say, hey, Lipton, what are you saying that's new? So uh, we went from freaking them out to boring them, but the reality is, yes, the science has come a long way and evolved and says that our complete um, vision of genetics and, and the concept of DNA controlling life is totally false. And why this is important is very simply, old science, genes control you, you don't control the genes, you're a victim of your heredity. Whatever is running in your family, you can likely expect to get that because of the genes that are running in the family. The new physics is completely different. It says that environment is controlling your genes. So if you change your response to the environment, change your environment, then you have power over your biology. Bottom line is simple. We move from victim biology genetics to master of biology epigenetics. And uh, this is the exciting time because this is the time for us to recover our power, that we are very powerful in controlling our biology. A uh, very simple understanding, if you go to an Apple store and you buy an iPod and you take it out of the store and you push play on the iPod, nothing plays. And, and then you're now upset about the fact you just spent all this money and your iPod doesn't work. And then some little seven-year-old kid next to you looks up and goes, hey, hey, mister, unless you download something first, it will not work. The idea is exactly the same. The mind uh, has a conscious creative mind. 
but a subconscious program mind. The conscious mind does not go into full operation until after age seven. The first seven years, the mind is in a lower vibrational state called theta. Uh, and this is when you can read this by putting wires on a person's head, EEG. The relevance of theta is that it represents imagination, which is what kids under seven live in. Half the world is imagination. The mother says, give me the broom. The child says, I don't know what you're talking about. This is a horse. When the, so to the child, the broom in the imagination state of theta actually is the horse. So theta is imagination. More important, theta is hypnosis. The relevance about that is if you think of all the rules an individual must learn to become a functional member of a family and a community, thousands of rules. I say, well, how do you teach an infant thousands of rules? And the idea is, well, you can't give them a book and you can't teach them in a school. So basically what we have to understand is this. Nature created the first seven years of download hypnosis to observe other people, the parents, the siblings, and the community, observe their behavior and directly download their behavior as the foundational download of behavior. Once a child is becoming conscious, which is around age seven, the conscious mind will use that programming to maneuver in the world. The most important part is this we have to recognize that this is a program. And number two is that most of the programming psychologists have revealed is negative and disempowering. Uh, and number three is that we are capable of changing the program. And once you understand that, then you are free to rewrite the story of your life. But if you don't do that, your life has been programmed. And this is not anything new. For 400 years, the Jesuits have said, give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. What people didn't understand they were saying is, if I get the program the first seven years, I will determine the outcome of that individual's life. Now, that sounds like, oh, that's an interesting fact. I go, it's a fact that has never been lost in 400 years. And in fact, today we're being programmed much more effectively than the Jesuits were programming 400 years ago. The hardest part about the programming is it occurs before your mind actually enters into consciousness, which is alpha vibration. Uh, so the first seven years you're downloading. And you've been downloading since actually before you were born in the last trimester of pregnancy. So the question becomes very seriously, what are my programs? And then why it becomes a question is you are not even conscious uh, when the programs are downloaded. So you say, well, I don't know what my programs are. I don't know what I learned when I was one year old. So the exciting part about it is that science has recognized that 95% of our life comes from subconscious programs. So a simple truth is this, you look at your life and it is a printout of your programs. So it's simple, you don't have to know who said what, who did what, that, that's blaming the messenger over the message. The message is what did you learn, program, and I say yeah but the program is what you're playing 95% of the time, so therefore look at your life and it comes down to simple and it goes like this. The things that you like that come into your life come in because you have programs to accept those. The other part though is anything that you work hard at, struggle over, sweat over, what you put a lot of effort into, question why are you working so hard to make these things manifest? The answer inevitably is your programs in your subconscious do not support that end. So the simple point is you wanna know your programming? Look at your life. As I said, the things you like that come are there because you have programs to support them. But in contrast, anything you must work at, anything you have to put effort into to manifest in your life, the amount of work you're putting in is really to compensate for the fact that you have a program that doesn't support that and you're trying to override it. The problem of who's running the show is whether the programs in the subconscious are running a show or whether the conscious is running a show. And the difference is simply this. The conscious mind is the driver. That's who you are. That's your identity, your source, your spirit. And, and why it becomes relevant is that the conscious mind, when driving the vehicle, controls where that body vehicle is gonna go. But when the conscious mind is thinking, then the default 
control, the autopilot steps in, which is called the subconscious. I mean, the simple point is this. I asked you a simple question. I say, what are you doing on Monday at 2 o'clock? If you actually try to answer that question, you have to go inside. I say, oh, if the conscious mind's going inside to answer the question, then who's controlling where you are outside? If you're walking down the street and you're thinking, it doesn't mean you stop until the thought is complete. You're still walking. If you're driving the car and you're thinking, you're still driving the car. Point. When the conscious mind is busy thinking 95% of the day, which is science's recognition, that means 95% of the day your program is being run by autopilot default, subconscious programming. Problem. The subconscious programs primarily came from other people. So it says 5% of the day you are controlling your biology to go toward your destination wherever you want. 95% of the day, you're in thought. So the autopilot subconscious is working 95% of the day. But those represent the programs downloaded from other people. The conclusion is simple. You're only controlling your life about 5% of the time. 95% is coming from the program. A psychologist recognized the vast majority of these programs are self-sabotaging, disempowering, and limiting the programs that we get. And why this becomes relevant, if 95% of your life is coming from those programs, no wonder we have to struggle to get through our life, to overcome. And for me, the most important fact that people have to understand is this. The word subconscious means below conscious. So when you are operating from the subconscious mind, when the conscious mind is busy thinking, you yourself don't even see the program. And why this is the most important thing to understand is if the program is self-sabotaging, then it says 95% of the day you will sabotage yourself with behavior that you got from other people uh, and you won't see you're doing it. And that makes you feel you're a victim of the universe. I go forth in the morning with wishes and desires, health, happiness, great relationship. And I come home at the end of the day finding I'm not getting there. And therefore, when I look at my life, I say, I have the great wishes and desires. The universe is not supporting me. And the problem is, no, you just haven't recognized 95% of the day you've been shooting yourself in the foot and you haven't even seen the gun. And this is where the problem comes from. So basically, it says, we are not running our lives that the invisible control autopilot subconscious is responsible for 95%. If we understand this, then there's an opportunity to look at your life. Say, what's not working? I go, why is it not working? And the answer is, not because the universe doesn't want you to have that. It's because your own program is self-sabotaging. There's a simple understanding about the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind is to create coherence between your beliefs and your reality. And well, this makes sense because what if your life didn't match your beliefs? That means every day you would get up and it's like, oh my God, everything's going crazy around here. But it turns out, no, life pretty much matches what you think. And you wake up every day and you go through the process and it's like, yep, this is the way life is without recognizing it's that way because we're manifesting it that way. And if you change the program, you recover the power. And so, simple point. People, seen, people have seen the movie The Matrix. And they say, oh, that's a science fiction movie. And I go, no, The Matrix is a documentary. We've all been programmed. The story of The Matrix is, yes, you've been programmed. I go, yes, every one of us has been programmed because the first seven years, the function of the brain is theta as the primary activity, which is hypnosis. Uh, and what I really want people to understand very simply is, in the movie The Matrix, there's this opportunity to take a red pill. And when you take the red pill, you get out of the program. I want people to understand that, yes, you've been programmed, as The Matrix says, and most of you have taken the red pill at one time or another. I say, when was that? And I say, when you fall deeply in love with somebody. I say, it's the taking the red pill. I say, what do you mean? I say, well, the day before you met this person, your life could suck. It could be, everything is just not right. I hate my life, blah, blah, blah. And then you meet this person and 24 hours later, it's heaven on earth that you're so healthy and happy and enjoy and everything is beautiful. Even that job that sucked yesterday is like, it's okay. And I go, 
the transition in that 24 hour period, the difference is when you fall in love, you stop defaulting to the subconscious program. You stay mindful. Mindful means, no, I'm keeping my hands on the wheel. I'm driving it. I'm not going to go into thought because if I go into thought, I let go of the wheel. So if I stay present, I'm controlling. And I go, and so what was the consequence of falling in love? And the answer was, you created heaven on earth. Even if it was just for a short few days or a week or a month, the reality was, what was different before you fell in love versus what happened immediately after? And the answer is, before you fell in love, 95% of your life was coming from subconscious programs. And the day you fall in love from that moment to the next period, you were actually driving your vehicle with your conscious wishes and desires. And when both people are operating from wishes and desires and not programs, together they manifest heaven on earth. So the simple line is this, we are capable of experiencing heaven on earth. The only problem is once we default back to the subconscious, we are not operating from our wishes and desires any longer. We are now operating from the downloaded programs of limitation that we got in the first seven years.